Good evening. Are you all blessed today? Yes. Amen. I'm going to start out by telling you a story of a man during the times of Christian persecution. In the year 156, this 86-year-old man was brought before a Roman official and asked to renounce his atheism. He was no atheist by our standards. Rather, he was a, the devout Christian Bishop Polycarp. To the Romans, however, he was an atheist, for he refused to worship the emperor as a god along with the other gods of Rome. Polycarp knew denial would mean a painful death, either being thrown into the arena with a wild animal or burned alive on a pyre. Three times he was questioned, three times invited to renounce his atheism. Swear and I release, curse Christ, urged the Roman official, to which Polycarp replied, 86 years have I served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Polycarp was not spared. A pyre was built and he was burned alive. But his words echo down through time to us. 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Let's kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord. We don't deserve any of your mercies, but I pray that you will be with me, Lord, as I speak, that it will be not my words, but your words speaking through me, that it may be a blessing to someone here tonight. In your name I pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to John 15, verse 13. John 15, verse 13. And it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Many of you have most likely heard this verse, but there is an attribute that we must have in order to do something like this. Any guesses? Love. Courage. What comes to your mind when you think of courage? The definition of courage from the New Oxford American Dictionary is the ability to do something that frightens one. However, the definition that stuck out the most to me was the one that says, acting on one's beliefs despite danger or disapproval, having the courage of one's convictions. As we delve deeper into this topic, we will learn how we can have courage to live boldly for Christ, resist temptation, and reach others for him. First, I'm going to tell you a story from my canvassing experience that helps illustrate my point. As some of you know, it was my first time canvassing last summer, and I got to go to Indiana and learn the canvas and the rest of the tips and strategies that come along with the program. And I started my first day. It was a series of miscellaneous thoughts that were going through my head as we were traveling to our destination. And one of them was, Lord, please do not let me get dropped off today. <laughs> one minute. I, one minute later, I am dropped off with my canvassing partner in a very rundown neighborhood, very similar to the ones that my mom told me about where people got shot and killed. To add to my stress, it was a very cloudy day and it was drizzling. After me and my canvassing partner finished praying, I was just standing there and thinking to myself, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And maybe I can just walk to the other end and call for pickup without canvassing. I finally got enough courage to walk up to the first house and muster my bravest smile. Feeling like everyone in the entire ghetto neighborhood is watching me, I walk up to an older gentleman who is sitting on his broken rocking chair, mechanically swaying back and forth as he breathes in the smoke of his cigarette. I was thinking to myself, do I have the book for you? Habits that heal coming right up. <laughs> However, as soon as I made eye contact with him, he points his arm down the road and tells me, keep walking, young man. I was taken back for a second and then reality sunk in. I had just been rejected. It really discouraged me, and I was panicking, not knowing what to do. My courage level plummeted after that. The question is, what am I trying to illustrate with this story? Sometimes our courage to live for Christ can be based on circumstances, whether or not we can quote scripture, say the right things, pretend that we are perfect, or even what clothes we wear. This all usually plays a role in how we act around others, but should it? 
Satan knows when we are trying to be sincere in our walk with God, and he makes every possible effort to discourage us from accomplishing this desire. What are some easy ways in which he is most effective in doing this? Fear of losing our possessions, our reputation, and fear of what our friends will say, and so on. Let's go to the book of Daniel and see the example of courage God has put in his word for us. Turn with me and your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Starting in verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom an hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. First of all, when we are looking for someone to put in an important position, what qualities do we look for in the person? Leadership, Leadership. Integrity. integrity, honesty. We can see here from the first two verses that Daniel was living out his Christian walk even in a heathen land, as confirmed in verse 3. Verse 3 says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. If we look farther down in the chapter, we can see that the others were jealous of him and convinced Darius, using his pride, to sign a decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. What do you think Daniel did when he heard the news? Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and closed his window so that nobody could see him and limited his prayers to once a day. No, what does it actually say? Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and, op- and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Why did Daniel commun- continue in his communication with God, even if it meant certain death for him? Because, as we saw earlier with Polycarp, Daniel had the courage to stand for God, knowing that God would reward him for his actions, if not in this life, then in the life after. He knew that God was the very source and essence of his success, and because he was being faithful, God would reward him again as he saw fit. We see the end result of his faithfulness starting in verse 20. And when he, Darius, came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice, and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me, forasmuch as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then the king was exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Wow, is not this an amazing, is it not amazing that God has put a story or verse for us ahead of time for every situation we will encounter? We see that Daniel's boldness for God not only brought restitution to his position, but also attributed honor and praise to God. And we know what happened to those who tried to get him in bad favor with the king. When we put God first, We do not have to try and make ourselves appear good. We will naturally have something different in us from God that other people will see and desire. What have we to fear if Christ is with us? Absolutely nothing. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Joshua 1, verse 9 says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. When God is a personal friend and Savior to us, he will uphold us and strengthen us with the right hand of his righteousness. Now, let's talk about the courage to reach others for Christ. How many of you that went canvassing this summer or did some other form of outreach found that when you put more effort into reaching the people instead of thinking about the money 
or of your own benefit, that God bless even more. Almost systematically, I found that the doors that I was the most hesitant of going to were the ones that he blessed at the most. Why is that? Because Satan does all he possibly can to discourage us from reaching those who will be the most receptive. He gives us a negative mindset to keep us in a rut of discouragement. Miss White says, When the shepherd becomes discouraged, wolves devour the sheep. Satan will work by any and every means which he can employ to discourage the active servants of God. If the shepherd can be beguiled from his duty, then the way is clear for the wolves to scatter and devour the sheep. When we have boldness for God, he will bless us and give us more energy for his work. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. When I was canvassing this summer, the more bold I was at the doors, the more energy I got, and the more blessing I received out of what I was doing. People will want what you believe in if you believe in it wholeheartedly. And when you put your whole heart into God's work, he will give you more courage to resist temptation. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Most of us probably know how the story goes. Starting in verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. If we go back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 49, we can see that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were among these officials of Babylon that were called to come and be present at the dedication of this image. We can also see that Nebuchadnezzar was trying to imply that his kingdom would last forever, fearful of having to see its demise. This factor played an important role in how far his anger reached when the three Hebrew men denied him. It reminded him of what he did not want to remember, that God changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Daniel 2, verse 21. We know how the rest goes. Everyone was summoned. Everyone was commanded to bow down at the sound of the music. Daniel chapter 3, verse 7 says, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. All the people, except whom? The three Hebrew men. How strong do you think the temptation was for those three youth to conform to the crowd? Usually when we are in a small group, and we are the only ones with something that is sticking out as of normal, we get pretty embarrassed, right? Normally, we don't break down the story, and we think what happened on the plain of Sharnar that day just happened. However, just imagine what was taking place in their minds. Most of Nebuchadnezzar's chief officials were there, and Daniel's three friends themselves held important positions. They were looked up to, and when they did not follow the crowd, they were the biggest eyesores on that whole plain. They could have just told each other, let's tie our shoes, sandals, or whatever they wore back then, and everyone will think that we're bowing down, but we're really not. Or they could have said, we stood for God when it came to the food. Maybe he'll just let this one slide by. Is not this what we do with God sometimes? I do this, this, and this. Therefore, I can get by with this. Is that what the three youth did? Absolutely not. How did they respond to Nebuchadnezzar? The Bible says in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Wow, I bet the king had a similar facial expression to the one I had when I got rejected while canvassing. They still resolved and firm a principle. And what was the end result? Verse 28 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. And in verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Miss White says in Education, 57, page 57, the greatest want of the world is a want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Where else do we see the plane of Shinar mentioned in the Bible? Any guesses? Tower of Babel, correct. It also has something to do with the glorification of man and the distrust in God's plans. Man's efforts to protect themselves and their legacy became an idol for them. It became their one and only consuming thought. In Song of Solomon, verse, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done. And that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. History tends to repeat itself, and many keep falling into the same trap. But God is calling us to stand up, be courageous, and leave the world to lift the Christian banner high. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 says, now the Lord has said unto Abram, who was living around the plain of Shinar as well, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. When we obey God's command, he will bless us more abundantly than we could ever ask. One story that illustrates this point very well tells about a man who came to a master of martial arts and asked him to teach him bravery. The master looked at him and said, I will teach you only with one condition. One month will you have to live in a big city and tell every person that you meet on your way that you are a coward. You have to say it loudly and openly while looking straight into the person's eyes. The man became really sad because this task seemed impossible to him. For a couple of days, he was thoughtful and sad, but to live with his cowardice was so unbearable that he traveled to the city to accomplish his mission. At first, when he would meet strangers, he quailed, lost his speech, and could not communicate with anyone. But he needed to finish the master's task. When he came up to the first stranger to tell about his cowardice, it seemed to him that he would die from fear but with each passing day, his voice sounded louder and more confident. Suddenly, the moment came when the man caught himself realizing that he was not scared anymore. This continued until a month had passed. The man came back to the master, bowed to him, and said, Thank you, teacher. I finished your task. Now I am not afraid anymore. But how did you know that this strange task would help me? The teacher replied, the thing is that cowardice is only a habit. And by doing it, and by doing it, the things that scare us, we can destroy the stereotypes and come to a conclude. Okay. The thing is that cowardice is only a habit. And by doing the things that scare us, we can destroy the stereotypes and come to the conclusion that you came to. And now you know that bravery is also a habit. And if you want to make bravery a part of yourself, you will need to move forward into fear. Then the fear will go away, and bravery will take fear away. God has always been with us, is always present, and will always be present to help us in our time of need. We just need to ask him to help us. He is simply waiting. My appeal to you tonight is that everyone, young and old, will step forward when God calls and say, Here I am, send me. With the help of Jesus, we can overcome the continuous cycle of the world, and stand apart as a special people of God that will bring the last day's message to it, and that will, we will have the courage to live boldly for him, reach others for him, and resist temptation in his name. If that is your desire today, please kneel with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, 
Thank you for all the examples in the Bible that we have of courage, Lord, courage to live for you. And I pray as we go throughout our lives, Lord, that we will remember that living for you will always bless us and that you are always there to be with us and to help us through everything that we're going through, Lord. And I just pray that you will bless us tonight as we go back to our dorms or wherever we may be and that you will give us safe traveling mercies. In your name I pray, amen.